Hello, dear friends. Uh, in our series of Applied Neuroanatomy, today we are going to discuss the anatomy of the third ventricle. As you know, the third ventricle is the ventricle uh, connecting the lateral ventricle with the fourth ventricle. It is connected to the lateral ventricle by the interventricular foramen of Monroe, and it is connected to the fourth ventricle by the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius. Uh, the recesses uh, are very important for the third ventricle, especially in endoscopic surgery. So, if you see the third ventricle, you see that it has got two anterior and two posterior recesses. The two anterior recesses are the supraoptic recess, or the optic recess, or the suprachiasmatic recess, which is present above the optic chiasm, and the other one is the infundibular recess, which leads to the infundibulum and the pituitary stalk. Posteriorly, there are two recesses also. One is the pineal recess, which is uh, a, a pouch in the pineal body, and one above the pineal body called the suprapineal recess. So anteriorly, the infundibular supraoptic, posteriorly, the pineal and the suprapineal. This is another view showing more detailed view of the recesses the supraoptic recess, infundibular recess anteriorly, and the pineal recess and suprapineal recess posteriorly. And you find here that the lateral wall of the, uh, hypo of the th uh, third ventricle is made by the thalamus, up and down, and anteriorly it is made by the hypothalamus, and they are both separated from each other by a, a groove on the medial surface of the third ventricle called the hypothalamic sulcus, separating the thalamus from the hypothalamus. This is a coronal view showing that the third ventricle is present between the two thalami. The, the lateral wall are the thalamus, and this is the roof and the floor. The floor of the third ventricle is formed anteriorly by the hypothalamus, we have two hypothalamus on each side, and posteriorly by the subthalamus. And the anterior part, as we said, the optic recess and the infundibular recess are present, and uh, the anteroinferior floor of the third ventricle is made by the hypothalamus. In cases of craniopharyngiomas, uh, which are tumors uh, that arise along the craniopharyngeal duct, you see that the tumor arises from the cella, then it grows upwards. I wanted just to show you here that as the tumor grows, it elevates the floor of the third ventricle, and it becomes behind the anterior wall of the third ventricle. So if you are going to approach this tumor through the lamina terminalis anteriorly, you get two layers of ependyma, one of the anterior wall of the third ventricle, and the other one is that of the floor of the third ventricle. This is a, an MRI picture showing the tumor in the supracellular region, and the chiasm is prefixed. That's displacing the chiasm anteriorly, so these cases are better approached from transphenoidal root, because the space here is narrow. The roof of the third ventricle it contains the choroid plexus hanging in the roof, coming from the foramen of Monroe, from the lateral ventricle, and it contains also astroglial cells, then it contains the inferior layer of telechoroidy, then it contains the venum interpositus and superior layer of telechoroidy. Of course, the lateral boundary of the third ventricle are the two thalami. This is a superior view showing the third ventricle, the massa intermedia connecting the two thalami together, and the thalamus in, on either side is present, forming the lateral wall, and on the roof there is also the habenal nuclei and the pineal uh, body, and there is also the stria terminalis connecting the habenal nuclei with the septal nuclei. Another view showing the superior layer of telechoroidy, the venum interpositus, 
the choroid plexus and the internal cerebral veins in the roof of the third ventricle. This is another view showing the pinea region, habenular areas, showing the cerebral laris, and showing the two thalami. Uh, perplexing technology, terminology sometimes we have uh, uh, many perplexing words that uh, might uh, uh, confuse you while you are talking about different uh, areas of this region, but we are trying to uh, explain more of this uh, 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 more of the structures which are very close to each other in name. So we have to clarify exactly what structure and what is it doing. Uh, the strata terminalis, the strata terminalis is a band of fibers connecting the amygdala to the septa nuclei. It is present in the roof of the temporal hole of the lateral ventricle, then it passes in the, the groove between the thalamus and the body of the caudate with the thalamus striate vein, and it reaches the septa nuclei, and it regulates hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis in response to stress. So when you are stressed, the emotions are present in the amygdala, they are transferred through this strata terminalis to the septal nuclei and to the hypothalamus, controlling the sympathetic system and the hormonal secretion. The lamina terminalis is another structure which forms the anterior wall of the third ventricle, and it extends from the rostrum of the corpus callosum to the posterior part of the upper optic asp, and it contains the organ vasculosum, regulating the osmolality, which is a part devoid of blood-brain barrier. And here you can see the stria terminalis, which is extending from, in green, from the amygdala, in the roof of the temporal hole, and on the surface of the thalamus, reaching the septal area, and reaching the hypothalamus. And here is the stria terminalis, and here is the lamina terminalis, which is extending from the rostrum of the corpus callosum to the upper part of the chiasm, posterior surface of the chiasm, and it is traversed by the anterior commission. So this is lamina terminalis, and this is stria terminalis. Another perplexing word is the stria medullaris thalami. As we said before, it carries afferent impulses from the septal nuclei to the habendal nuclei, it's involved in salivation. When you smell the odor of food, you can salivate through this mechanism. It's connected to the smell and to the uh, salivary nuclei. And this is the strimedalaris thalami extending from the habendular uh, nuclei in the habendular trigon anteriorly into the septal region. Other perplexing terminology is the lamina affixa. What is the lamina affixa? Uh, you go just lateral to the choroid plexus. In the lateral ventricle, you find the lamina affixa. It is a single layer of ependymal lateral to the choroid plexus on the roof of the thalamus, covering the thalamus striate vein. It is bounded laterally by the thalamus striate vein and the stria terminalis, and medially by the tinea choroide attaching it to the choroid plexus. So, laterally, Thalamus striate vein and stria terminalis, medially by the tinea choroide attaching it to the choroid plexus. The tinea choroide, as we said before, is just a band of fibers on the roof of the thalamus connecting the choroid plexus laterally to the lamina affixa, and the tinea fimbri is a band of fibers, pi a meter, on the roof of the thalamus connecting the choroid plexus to the fimbri of the fornix medial to the tinea choroide. This we can see here. The hypo, as we said, choroid plexus is fixed to the floor of the lateral ventricle or the roof of the third ventricle by the tinea choroide, the tinea laterally, and the tinea fornices or tinea fimbri medially, just lateral to the chor choroid plexus is the lamina affix. As you see it here, the lamina affix. And this is a coronal view showing the third ventricle 
the roof of the third ventricle and the choroid plexus attached medially by the tinea fornices and laterally by the tinea choroidae and lateral to it is the lamina affixa between the thalamus triad vein and the choroid plexus. So here also the thalamus, this is the thalamus triad vein and the tinea choroidae and lateral, this is here the lamina affix. Another, if you take the choroid plexus, you can see it more clear, the lamina affix. Other perplexing terminology, the superior layer of tilla choroidae is just pay a matter on the roof of the thalamus. It is forming the superior layer of the venum interpositus and it ends by lining the corpus callosum. And the inferior layer of tilla choroidae is pi a meter also, also on the roof of the thalamus, but forming the inferior layer of the virum interpositum and ends by lining the quadrigeminal plate. So as it goes posteriorly, the tilla choroidae lines, superior layer lines the splenium of the corpus callosum, inferior layer lines the quadrigeminal plate of the midbrain. Both layers contain the venum interpositum with the internal cerebral veins and the medial posterior choroidal arteries in between. This is a coronal cut showing the tilla choroidae, superior layer, tilla choroidae, inferior layer, present on the roof of the third ventricle, and the content internal cerebral veins and the medial posterior choroidal arteries. This is another view from above, and you can see the venum interpositum superior layer and the internal cerebral veins. This is the velum interpositum after removing all the veins and everything, and it is forming the roof of the third ventricle. And this is after removing the two layers of velum interpositus and going interfornicial through the roof of the third ventricle. This is the cavity of the third ventricle. These are the right and left thalami, and you find a structure here connecting the two thalami together, which is the massa intermedia, and the contents of the venum interpositum are the internal cerebral veins and the medial posterior choroidal arteries. Here I'm displacing the choroid plexus medially, and you see the choroid plexus is attached to the thalamus laterally by the tinea choroidae and medially by the tinea fimbri. Here it is attached to the thalamus, tinea fimbri are attached to the fornix. The endoscopic anatomy is very important when you go through the endoscope, through the uh, lateral ventricle and foramen of Monroe, you will find these structures from inside. So this is the lamina terminalis or the anterior wall of the third ventricle. Then you find the optic chiasm or, and the chiasmatic recess. And this is the infundibular recess. And you see here the mammillary bodies. And this is the floor of the third ventricle, anteriorly, which is called the tuber cinerium, is a very transparent structure and is very important, surgical importance. You will see it now. This is where we do the lesions for endoscopic third ventriculostomy, what we call the ETV mammillary, and thin membrane go and open this to connect the third ventricle with the supracellular cisterns and with the better cistern, prepontine cistern, and the subacronal space, but don't go so far laterally because you might injure the posterior communicating arteries. Uh, this is an endoscopic view in the lateral ventricle before going into the foramen of Bogol, showing the fornix forming the anterior wall and the roof of the foramen of Bogol. The posterior wall is formed by the thalamic tubercle. These are the columns of the fornix, and when you go through the foramen of Monroe, you will find that that means you go into the third ventricle, the antro inferior part of the floor, anterior part of the floor, you find the mammillary bodies and the thin transparent structure, which is the tuber cinerium, and you do your hole here, you open with the uh, Fogarty's catheter, and you do the ETV, and here you see the basilar artery communicating the third ventricle with the uh, prepontine cistern. 
uh, another view of the third ventricle uh, through the foramen of Monroe, where you find the thalamus side vein, the septal vein, and the choroid plexus. Uh, here is the choroid plexus going inside into the roof of the third ventricle from the posterior part of the foramen of Monroe. You find the septal vein, thalamus side, unifying together, forming the internal cerebral vein, what we call the venous angle. And this is another view from inside the third ventricle. You see the right and the left thalami and the interthalamic adhesions. You see here the mammillary bodies. And you see here uh, the internal cerebral vein, right and left, on the roof of the third ventricle. Uh, again, if you go very thin layer, of pi a meter in front of the mammillary bodies, the, the tuber scenarium, tuberal area. This is where you do your lesion. And you can find here the dorsum cellae, apparent here and here the basilar artery. Again, if you see the opticism from inside, uh, you know that the lamina terminalis is above the chiasm in the upper part of the posterior surface and connecting it to the rostrum of the corpus callosum. The microscopic anatomy, if you do a tyrional approach or the subfrontal approach, you can see this picture, the optic nerves, the optic asp, and after the optic asp, you see a thin membrane, which is the lamina terminalis, here the A1 segment of the right and A1 segment of the left side, and in between the anterior communicating artery, and here we open the lamina terminalis, which is the anterior wall of the third ventricle, and we entered inside the third ventricle from the lamina terminalis. Approaches to the third ventricle, we can go through the foramen of Monroe, as we saw before. We can go into Formicien, where we, as we saw the picture, we open the midline in between the two fornices, in between the internal cerebral veins, in between the middle posterior choroidal arteries, and you open the roof of the third ventricle. Or you can go subchoroidal, by incising the lamina affixa lateral to the choroid plexus and displacing the choroid plexus medially so that you expose the roof of the third. And there is also an approach through the lamina terminalis as you saw before. And there is something very important, the posterior pineal approach. Approaches to the pineal region. Here is the uh, splenium of the corpus callosum. And here is the tectum. And here is the pineal gland, a posterior part of the third ventricle. So, as we said, the floor, hypothalamus, subthalamus, and the roof is made of the, uh, the tilla choroide, inferior layer and superior layer of the internal cerebral veins, and the anterior wall is made by the lamina terminalis. Posteriorly, the floor and the roof unite together at the pineal region. This is a very detailed anatomy of the pineal region to show you that the internal cerebral veins on the roof of the third ventricle unite with the inferior sagittal sinus forming the, before they form the great cerebral vein of Galen, and then the great cerebral vein of Galen unifies with the inferior sagittal sinus forming the straight sinus. And this is an anthroposterior view. This is the pineal region. When you remove tumor from the pineal region, you enter automatically the posterior third ventricle. So you can reach it through the supra, infra, through the infratentorial supracerebellar approach between the cerebellum and the tent, or the posterior transcarnosa, or occipital transcentorial from the occipital loop. <coughs> supracerebellar infratentorial approach to the pineal gland, patients in the semi sitting position. You can do it sitting or lateral position. Take all measures in the sitting position to prevent air embolism. This is details uh, of importance to neurosurgeons, uh, not for neuroanatomy. It can be approached by a midline or paramedian approach. And then the advantage of the paramedian, the cerebellar hemisphere is lower laterally than in the midline. And you open your flap and you expose the transverse sinus and you do stitches in the tent, levating it upwards 
to clarify the vision. Uh, the quadrigeminal arachnoid is very thick. If you don't find the tumor, you should look always down because it can be hidden by the cerebellum. Try always to open the posterior third ventricle after taking out the tumor to prevent hydrocephalus. And most important is good knowledge of the anatomy of this region. The tricks for the sitting position, these are general tricks to be said to neurosurgeons. You all know about it. It's not the place here. And if air embolism, the most uh, devastating complication and frequent complication that occurs with the sitting position. And this is a view of the tent and the cerebellum and what we see in the midline. This is an operative view uh, showing the cerebellum going down, cutting the veins between it and the tent and getting a space between the cerebellum and the tent, what we call the supracerebellar infratentorial approach. And then we go to find this complex structure of veins, which are the great cerebral vein of Gallen, the basal veins of Rosenthal on either side. So this is the great cerebral vein of Gallen in the midline, basal veins of Rosenthal on either side. This is the precentral cerebellar vein going to the great cerebral vein of Gallen. So great cerebral vein, right and left, basal veins of Rosenthal, precentral cerebellar vein, and you can find here the internal or the occipital veins. This is a view, what you find, like the reverse of a basilar uh, posterior cerebral bifurcation. You see that the great cerebral vein of Gallen here, and you see there's two arms raised up. They are the basal veins of Rosenthal. This is the view you can see about the venous system, great cerebral vein of Gallen, left and right basal veins of Rosenthal. This is a view of the tumor. This is the tent, cerebellum, and the tumor, and the basal vein is stretched by the tumor laterally. This is another view. Look here, when I said paramedian is better because the cerebellum is concave laterally, and you can get from this space more space if you look from lateral than if you look from the midline. Uh, this is another view of the tumor and another view of the tumor. And the other approach is the occipital transtentorial approach for the pineal region. Uh, this approach, you, uh, the patient lies in the lateral position. The head is rotated downwards uh, to the ground, and then you have to drain CSF because you don't have access to CSF uh, in this approach, and the drainage of CSF should be uh, lumbar puncture or putting a drain. Uh, better hold the occipital loop upwards to prevent its herniation and damage by gravity. Uh, this is the flap. We use the skin flap for the occipital transcentorial. This is the bone flap. You open above and below the transverse sinus. And this is the view. And this is the operative details. Thank you very much. I hope uh, you had a good knowledge of this region. Uh, and uh, uh, this region is shared by, uh, there is an overlap between this region of the third ventricle and other lesions around. And this is the site of many roads of surgical access to the brain. And we hope to see you in the next, uh, uh, the next, uh, uh, topic we're going to talk about. Thank you very much.